Hello, everyone. I'm Anna Rose. I work in exhibitions and programming at the Venom Museum. I'm very excited to welcome you all today for our first Cold War Spaces conversation series. Um, this is part of our Venda Online virtual programming initiative during these times. <clears throat> See more people are joining by the minute. Um, we're, uh, we're joined by Susan Reed. She's a professor of transnational and modern European history at Durham University, as well as a visiting professor of cultural and visual history at Loughborough University in England. She's published extensively on material culture, art, gender, consumption, and everyday life in the USSR. Um, we also have here today um, our chief curator and director of programming, Yu Sigal. Um, all of us actually worked together last year on our exhibition Watching Socialism, so this is a nice little reunion, virtual reunion of sorts. Um, and that opened last year, and Yus will start us off with some info on this discussion series. I'll hand it off to you. All right, thank you very much, Anna Rose, and uh, welcome everyone to Cold War Spaces. This is the Wendy Museum's first uh, online discussion series. That's so all we have participants today from all over the United States, but also from Great Britain, France, Germany, the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Russia. So it's a true global uh, meeting today. Welcome everyone and thanks uh, for joining. Uh, the coronavirus has uh, severely impacted our freedom of movement. And so the idea came up for some uh, reflection on space, both real and imaginary in this series. Today and in the coming weeks, we will cover topics like private space, public space, secret space, transnational space, outer space, utopian space, creative space and changing space. And not only will this give us a wide perspective on Cold War history, but it might also inspire us to reflect on how our world is spatially organized and maybe what it is that makes us feel at home. So I'm very um, happy and excited to welcome our guest speaker, Susan Reed uh, today, with whom I will talk about private space in the Soviet Union. Susan, uh, may I ask you first a personal question? How has the coronavirus impacted your private space? Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Joost, for, for inviting me to join your series. Um, I have to say I'm quite lucky because I, I, I do like working at home anyway. I find it a good space to work. I miss the interaction with students and colleagues, I must say, yes. But um, I have a nice park outside. One thing I, I've right. found, though, the, particularly in the, the early stages when people were getting used to it, was just how much I was taken back to the dying days of the Soviet Union with people going in search of toilet rolls and flour and other basic necessities. And it just reminded me of always carrying the little just in case bag uh, with you and, uh, to try and find something if you happen to see it in a shop. And, but also that sense of um, surveillance of uh, being monitored uh, because quite early on there was a confusion here with the police uh, when the, the restrictions on movement were introduced and there was uh, not very much clarity about what they actually meant. And uh, so uh, there was a question about whether you could go into the Peak District, which is just nearby and beautiful walking countryside. Um, and we went out one day um, to avoid our very busy park. And uh, it's just five minutes drive. It's not a long way. Uh, but the police were putting drones up to uh, check wow. that people weren't out enjoying themselves and having picnics. And uh, so <laughs> that was rather the, the kind of potential of uh, infringements of civil liberties is quite stark. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe we can come back to that point uh, later in our conversation. But I would like to uh, ask you first, maybe a more general question. How would you characterize um, private space in the Soviet Union or maybe even broader under socialism in the Soviet bloc and how does it generally differ from a private space in for instance capitalist countries? Uh, well the private spaces that I'm most interested in myself are really the spaces of everyday life particularly the home and uh, taking the home quite 
broadly to include the yard and the space around the, the house, but particularly the, um, the separate apartment of the, of the cruise shop era uh, introduced in the, in, in the uh, second half of the 1950s. Um, yeah, maybe Susan, you can uh, tell us a little bit about that uh, transition from the communalka, the communal apartment, to the family apartment. How, when and how did that happen? Uh, so in the uh, in the Khrushchev era, um, in, in particular, the, there was a um, a real drive towards uh, mass housing uh, to try and uh, and solve the really massive housing shortage, and to do this by uh, rejecting the expensive. Um, uh, labour intensive kind of architecture of the Stalin period and shifting towards industrialised uh, architecture, uh, even rejecting the very concept of architecture, replacing it by one of construction and engineering and moving towards type plans, uh, standardisation, modularisation, prefabrication. Um, and this would, so th this was a principle that Khrushchev really put his weight behind. And then in 1957, um, there was a, 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 an announcement of a major housing campaign uh, on this basis of prefabrication uh, to build uh, separate family apartments for the nuclear family, um, right. which in some ways was contradictory because at the same time, there were um, calls for the withering away of the family. Uh, to realise that idea that had been fundamental from the start, that the family was a bourgeois institution and that it should wither away uh, on the way to communism. And well, yet the these state wasn't withering the away, the family was, so to speak. Yes. <laughs> right, yeah. And, and how did this new development uh, impact uh, the sense of privacy? Uh, well, so um, in terms of how, how a, a sense of privacy, I mean, there's different ways we can think about the private, but mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the, the fact of having an apartment where you could shut your front door, um, an apartment that was for the nuclear family rather than part of a communal, a fam a communal apartment or in uh, barracks and hostels. I mean, this was a, a major shift, a major improvement for, for millions of families who received these apartments over the next 10 years. Uh, many of the informants, in, I did an oral history project and um, many of the informants in that had been uh, homeless and um, uh, had been living in corners of rooms or in in hostels where the only space they could call their own was was really the space around a bed uh, a kind of cot right. bed right. with maybe just a little bit nightstand next to it and that was the only private space with maybe a curtain to isolate you from other people yeah. um, how so did you do that if you wanted apartment. to make love to your partner for instance well, you, you uh, had to do it with, with people, you might have a curtain, but you didn't have any sort of auditory privacy. And uh, in hostels, it was quite common to just, you know, get on with it <laughs> with somebody else asleep or trying to sleep in the same room. Right. Susan, you prepared some uh, magnificent images uh, to show us uh, some mm -hmm. examples of um, uh, building projects and how interiors typically look like. Yeah, please show us something. Yeah. Can you see that? No. You can't see, see it just a minute. Um. We have been practicing this, so this should uh -huh. work out. <laughs> um, we can just see your desktop. Can you only see my desktop? Oh dear. Uh, let's stop sharing then. And. Uh, okay. um, did, did you use share screen or? Yes, so I did. Let's, yeah. let's not bother about yes, it. Yes, let's not bother uh, about yeah. uh, to yes, talk yes, about. Yes. Yeah. That's, uh, so, um, uh, one uh, thing that struck me is that apart from uh, uh, very interesting um, interior um, images, you also shared a garden image. And how did gardens um, add up to the sense of uh, private space in the Soviet Union? Um, so the garden image that I that I showed you was um, it, it was it, outside one of these uh, Khrushchevki as they're known the the uh, uh, prefabricated apartment blocks and that was common space so it was shared space it wasn't private space at all and uh, uh, but it, it it was sort of stuck in a sort of in between 
uh, state between uh, being public um, and having nobody caring for it. Uh, so common space that was, um, as Jordana Boyim, a literary historian, has written about how these were kind of no man's lands. Um, however, my research uh, found a lot of cases where people actually took care of those spaces and in a sense privatized them uh, in that they that because the state wasn't taking care um, people actually um, began to take care of them themselves and start planting shrubs and fruit trees and uh, plants and to water them and, and to maintain mm. them um, so in a sense it's a kind of privatization of this common space interesting they filled the void so to speak and uh, yes yes yeah. yeah. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, how uh, the organization of private space in the Soviet Union, maybe inside and outside, if you include gardens, was uh, re reflected gender roles and uh, gender expectations? Gender roles. Um, yeah. although, although the Soviet Union uh, claimed to uh, improve uh, gender equality and to improve the lot of women and that was um, a major pitch under Khrushchev as well to to free women from household slavery uh, by uh, improving services and by uh, beginning to produce household appliances. Uh, in practice the the gendering of domestic space remained in place and uh, uh, so th that the um, in, in practice, the, there was very little sharing of uh, household duties and the responsibility for uh, the aesthetics of the home really fell on women as well. I'll try again, just, uh, just uh, if you bear with me, I'll just try again to, to share the screen. Sure. Um, and uh, I don't know if that's, is that sharing now? We just see you now. Yeah. Oh, and so that's not sharing, okay. Right. Um, so I won't. I won't uh, um, try any more. Then that that's to, fine. That's the. Yes. I, I think uh, we are fine. So another um, uh, question I would have is: um, uh, you mentioned the Khrushchev era uh, changes in uh, private space in the organization of space. What happened after Khrushchev in the Brezhnev era, and maybe also in the era of? Uh, um, Glasnost and Perestroika under Gorbachev, uh, did political changes in any way impact the way people were organizing their living rooms or was there some visual reflection of political change in the apartment? Uh, I suppose it depends whose departments, uh, apartments you're thinking of. I mean, the, mm -hmm. um, it, the minority of... Uh, distant intelligentsia um, of um, uh, unofficial artists and uh, 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 writers who were um, semi-official or unofficial. Um, for, for people like that, then the apartment was a very important space to be able to share ideas, but also sometimes to, to actually exhibit work. Um, so apartment exhibitions uh, in the 1970s, but then in the early 1980s, there was a movement actually called Aptart, which mm -hmm. was really using the apartment as, as an exhibition space to create a new public for their that art. That might sound people. very uh, strange uh, to many of us. Can you say a little bit more about that? How did apartment exhibitions work? How were they organized? And how would you um, visualize what happened there? Uh, well, so, I, I mean, usually because these are small apartments, uh, they would be by invitation, but quite often the invitations then they were passed from um, verbally and more people came, including sometimes uh, foreign journalists or diplomats, which could uh, cause a, a problem because uh, because then the KGB would, would find out about it and come and, and uh, close the exhibition. Um, but the... Uh, uh, the, the interesting thing is really how it became a, a specific phenomenon from being initially a way of um, making it possible to exhibit when you couldn't exhibit it in public spaces. Um, it became, became actually something that was made a virtue of, I suppose, in a sense, using this private space to create a new kind of public. Um, 
And were those uh, secret um, uh, organized exhibitions, secretly organized? Um, did the KGB, for instance, try to find out where those exhibitions were held? Or was this all uh, more or less accepted? Um, it tolerated, I suppose. Tolerated, uh, uh, right. Yes, and, and uh, depending when, uh, I mean, they always had the power to come in and, and stop these and um, but but some of the time they were permitted there was that kind of shady zone of, of permitted cultural activity right and what about other alternative uh, private spaces I'm thinking of the Soviet hippie movement for instance or maybe countercultural or dissident artists and intellectuals did they have a, a different approach to a private space as far as you know yeah. um, well, the, uh, the, the idea that private space, space could be a site for um, meeting for creative discussions, for um, exchanging information, uh, uh, that was very important. Um, uh, at the same time, I mean, so the kitchen has become sort of mythologized as a site for those nighttime discussions, you know, the idea of, of sitting around, drinking tea and and having philosophical discussions at the same time in some ways the kitchen was actually the most public space in that it was the space that was most linked into uh, networks of uh, you know water electricity all the supplies it's so it's a kind of node of public communications um, and it was also the space that was most uh, determined perhaps by um, prescriptions, by advice, by ideas about uh, how people should live, a modern, rational, efficient kind of way of living. And so all those ideas kind of focused on the kitchen and yet at the same time it was this space of creativity and free thinking. Right, uh, was it also connected to the fact that people might have feared that their living room was uh, bucked uh, by the KGB or something like that? Or is um, that not if they were already of interest to yeah. the KGB, then then perhaps. I mean, the sort of um, the sort of people that I uh, um, worked with for interviews were not. Um, they were not likely to be of of interest and uh, right. so I but but at the same time in sometimes I mean some one of the ways that that people would maybe uh, uh, find a way to talk more freely was just simply to leave the apartment and uh, so you know you'd go off into the woods and uh, uh, stand around a tree and and talk in in that way if you if you did fear that there was a possibility not so much being bugged, but maybe of um, of uh, having neighbours listening in. Uh, right. So in these separate apartments, I mean, the point is that the separate apartments was much less likely for that. But at the same time, you know, somebody might sitting at, be sitting on the bench outside the door and watch people going in and out and have an right. idea of who is visiting regularly. Right. Uh, so the what you know you what you did feel that there was some kind of scrutiny and monitoring. And you mentioned that at those uh, kitchen table and uh, night conversations, they typically drank tea. I would have expected maybe vodka. Or... Well, it could be vodka as well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. right, right. Mm -hmm. And then maybe my uh, final question before we open it up to uh, Q&A. Can you tell us something about what happened in Russia in terms, again, of private space and uh, uh, apartment policy? after the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. Um, were there uh, revolutionary changes and all of a sudden everything uh, looked like uh, an American apartment or a West European apartment? Or were there certain uh, continuities in, uh, as, as well? What can you say about those changes? Uh, well, so changes took place gradually, really, and I mean, one of the, the quickest changes was privatisation of apartments, but that wasn't universal or not immediately. Um, uh, something that was sort of visible at the time was uh, that people started building on balconies on the front or glazing in their balconies so to create extra space, and uh, that happened fairly quickly. Um, and and it was noticeable because the facade of these buildings was changing quite rapidly, and to some extent, 
um, there was a, a, an effort to knock through, to create sort of American kitchens, they sort of knocked through opening up, but that wasn't always possible technically, uh, given the, the structures of the, the buildings. Um, uh, I suppose one of the most obvious changes was the, the Khrushchev era apartments were very carefully planned to allow for, for open space and light and air between the blocks. But they were in relatively central positions um, and by the 90s they, those places were really prime real estate so so what began to happen was that um, first of all those yards began to be become car parks as people right. started to buy cars but then that the uh, the space in the middle started to be built on uh, with high-rise blocks with with uh, more luxurious apartments in the middle. Uh, so taking away the light and sunlight from the, the low-rise uh, Khrushchev era buildings. I see, I see, right. So let's uh, move to some uh, questions. And I have a question here uh, from um, Daisy Smith. And what do you know about the house on the embankment? And what's the idea of passing an apartment down to someone in your family, thereby holding onto it? I don't know if oh. this is something you can comment on. Uh, yes, yeah, so the house on the embankment was Stalin era building, so it pre uh -huh. predates the, the ones that we've been, been talking about. Um, and uh, there have been studies of the people, the individuals who lived there, because they were, they were often very high up party officials and notables. Um, and they, they, there was a second half to the, um, there was a second half to the question, which was about passing down, passing on apartments. Uh, um, yeah, right. What is the idea of passing an apartment down to someone in your family, thereby holding on to it? Yes, so so um, that um, happened very frequently. I think I mean, people, in theory, didn't own, they, these weren't private property, they were rented, but there were still ways of, of making sure that, uh, um, that your uh, children could go on living there um, informally. Right, right. We have a question from John. Is Dr. Reed's a screen background a model Soviet apartment and <laughs> great TV? It says. <laughs> Can you say something about the image where you are sitting yes. in right now? Um, yeah. So this was is this was a model uh, apartment in the so-called contemporary style, and uh, it, which was introduced in the, the late 1950s and early 1960s uh, with the idea that um, it was. Uh, a design of furniture that could be mass produced relatively cheaply but that would be appropriate for the new apartments because when when millions of people started moving into the new separate apartments they had very little to bring with them um, uh, and actually if you tried to bring the old furniture it would just be too big and heavy you couldn't get it up the stairs or through the door uh, let alone live with it in these spaces and it made the ceilings feel very low um, so there was a campaign to introduce sort of this new style of furniture, and uh, and this is a this is a model example that was shown as, as a, an exhibition of prototypes, uh, both to to inform people to kind of teach them about this new style and make it acceptable, uh, but also to get some feedback from from uh, potential you know future consumers. Right. I have a question from uh, Patricia who asks, uh, were dachas for everybody? We talked about gardens, but not about dachas. And were those spaces where you got some extra private space? Uh, dachas, yes, yes. And, uh, but also they were a place for um, a different sort of privacy, which is a kind of private economy of being able to cultivate vegetables and, and fruit. Um, and mostly for your, yourself or your family for subsistence, but, uh, but sometimes it could also be traded for, for other things. Um, but yes, so, so the Dutch is an important space. Yeah. Right. I see here some comments about people who would love to see your um, picture. So maybe we can uh, share them with uh, the people who actually attend um, this meeting and uh, we will send them through email afterwards, if that is okay, then you can have a look. Yes. We, would that be okay with you, Susan? Yes, yes, sure, yes. yes. Yeah. Let me see. So I have two questions, um, uh, Patricia, 
Patricia and Ricardo that uh, boil down to more or less the same. I will read uh, Ricardo's um, question. Since the apartments were state built, did they come with any sort of KGB surveillance devices embedded? So were they actually already part of the construction? Yeah. It's uh, not that I know of. Um, I mean, certainly the, the I mean, the sort of apartments where I did my study uh, were with fairly kind of ordinary people um, and who weren't of of uh, great interest. They never seem to have, have have mentioned it, but I mean the, that that it would have been actually embedded in the in the walls in in the structure. Uh, so I don't I don't know. It's not something that I've actually um, uh, had experience of from from the interviews that I that I did. Right, right, right. So Maria has a question about the garden and asked if um, how they were uh, uh, used in a privatized way by people. If they, for instance, also grew. Uh, use them for consumption to grow vegetables, fruits, etc. Yeah. Uh, sorry, yeah, I didn't. For, it, yeah, about so the this public is a question about prices. the gardens. Yes, yes. Well, so um, I mean, I I did do some research on on that, and uh, I mean, these tended to be neglected spaces. They they were supposed to be landscaped when the apartment blocks were built, um, but the bodies that were supposed to do it were either neglected it or they were just so busy moving on to building the next housing block that the landscaping just got left behind and so um, people the residents uh, often uh, grouped together and sourced shrubs and trees sometimes from the if they if they'd come from small houses with gardens they sometimes went back to them and brought the shrubs and planted them and uh, uh, but they did they did try to grow vegetables and particularly fruit trees and uh, to to but also to create playgrounds for children and the sports sports grounds and places to to sit um, in in those spaces. Right, right. And in a way that's a, it's 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 a kind of um, it's somewhere as I said between public and private. So it was a communal kind of action. And uh, I mean, there were also Subotniki, these uh, sort of uh, enforced volunteering uh, to clear up the yard. Uh, but, but I think the, that the, uh, the planting often happened much more as a collective uh, uh, group uh, activity that was spontaneous. Right. I have a question from Geneva here. In all the documentaries and movies I've seen, Soviet apartments are communal, shown as three families in one floor or apartment. How common was that? I think we uh, covered that a little bit with um, um, the transition from the Stalin era to the Khrushchev era, but maybe it's interesting to see in how far those communal apartments were still around during and after the 1950s. Uh, yes, and they still were, because although, although uh, the um, Khrushchev era housing campaign did produce millions of apartments, and um, uh, but the, the problem was huge, and so it, it the, many people did remain in in communal apartments right up to the end of the Soviet Union and and beyond. Right. Yeah. A question from Felicitas. Um, I'll read it in full. Thank you for this great conversation. Dr. Reed, you mentioned earlier that there was a tendency to encourage the building of private apartments. Nancy Quick from UC San Diego shows in her book on home ownership that the US exported their model of private home ownership to Asia, Latin America and beyond. Do you think that the US model of private home ownership inspired the desire among Soviets to live in private apartments? Um. That's a very interesting question. I, I'm not sure how much um, uh, people would have been aware of that model. I mean, there was an encounter with the American uh, model home at the American Exhibition in Moscow in 1959. Uh, so that uh, the Soviet viewers to uh, that exhibition and readers of the press encountered the, the American way of life and the ideal American home. Um, but I'm not sure that the model of ownership was really what was of interest there and more. It was the level of consumption and comfort in, in this modern American home that was, was picked up on. 
Um, yeah. I mean, there was, of course, um, there, there, there were private houses, the small sort of rural houses. Uh, so it wasn't that there was, there, there was no model of private ownership in, in the Soviet Union. Um, and it depends which part of the Soviet Union you're talking about as well, because in the Baltic, there was a very different kind of pattern. Um, right. Yeah. Well, speaking about consumption, Michelle has a question. Was consumerism being promoted? And if so, if people had small spaces, how did they actually um, cope with that? How did they find place for everything they bought? <laughs> That's a lovely question. Um, uh, yes, so, so in a, a sense, consumerism was beginning to be promoted. I mean, the, the idea of, increase, of improving people's living standards and that, uh, that the consumer had a role to play in the, uh, um, in, in the modernization of, of the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, so, uh, and this, this, this move to new flats was a very important part of this, that it was recognized that in moving to a new flat, you needed to become a consumer because you needed to start buying things to, to equip it. Uh, but that they should be uh, not lavish, they should be rational, mass-produced things. So this furniture that's in the interior behind me, that it should be possible to produce it through industrial methods and using uh, man-made materials, so as not to use too many natural resources, for example. Um, and, and then the, the question of what to do with all the stuff was very much discussed. The idea was, was uh, also that in principle, people shouldn't accumulate stuff uh, that they didn't need. It should just be uh, what they actually needed for their everyday lives, uh, that they shouldn't start consuming, um, accumulating things just through for the love of things. Uh, and uh, so uh, there were some, discussions I've seen among architects and designers saying, well, people shouldn't have cupboards because they simply shouldn't have all this stuff that they need to put away. But already by the, the later part of the 1960s, there was a growing recognition that people were accumulating things and they needed somewhere to put it. And that, that the, the newer designs of housing had to allow for that and have more built-in cupboard space. Right, thank you. <clears throat> I have here a question from Rachel who says, Methodologically, how do you approach studying privacy in a dictatorship? <laughs> uh, yes, it's a, that's uh, an interesting one. I mean, I, th I think that, uh, um, I mean, my approach is, is really through uh, material culture and oral history, but in combination with uh, looking a lot at, at uh, the professional advice and the media reports. And I think one important point is that uh, the home, the private space, uh, remained very uh, firmly in the public eye, in the public sphere. Uh, so the media reports on it, endless advice about how you should furnish and equip your apartment, about the nature of uh, modern um, good taste, for example. Uh, so this kind of intrusion on the on the private sphere, constantly keeping it in the in the in the public eye. Right. Oh, I have here a very nice <coughs> question from Sue, who writes: In Susan's opinion, did Soviet apartment dwellers who could not acquire endless consumer merchandise? seem any happier or more content in life than those of us in Western societies who could, as a way of life, compete with each other in conspicuous consumption? Did they read more, enjoy art, art more, develop great conversational skills, etc.? Uh, it's yeah. very hard to measure relative happiness, I think. Right. Uh, I mean, one thing I should say is that, that people recall the moment of getting their apartments as being one of great joy even if retrospectively they seem quite small and plain and basic, uh, that that memory of moving into this, um, this space was one of, of just deep, profound pleasure. Um, uh, but, so, but whether they um, read more or had more free time uh, because of these, I, I'm, I'm not sure because actually consumption was also a bit of an obsession. I mean, just trying to get hold of the right things, being putting your name down for a furniture suite of the right 
finish that you wanted that was also a concern um that so um uh, so yes I, I found it very hard to answer that conclusively an interesting yeah, right. question though very definitely for sure yeah i have here two related uh, questions by frank uh, who uh, says there is a movement today in the united states for co-living which resembles greatly communal living of the stalin era but is voluntary and not usually involving families with children. Do you think this will likely be a short-lived trend or a permanent solution for increasing housing in expensive urban areas? And then a second question also from him. The related concept is the vast expansion of assisted living for elderly people here. Any ana analogies from Soviet times? Um, so, uh, and I think I think this question about communal living, um, I mean the fact that it's it doesn't often involve families with children. I mean there was an idea also in the in the Khrushchev era, going back to the 1920s, uh, that of uh, of social condensers they were called, which was a kind of collective form of of living. Um, in the 1920s, the, the idea was was very radical, and that it should make people into more collective beings uh, by living together. Uh, by, the, um, by the 60s, the model of, of collective living in new blocks, I mean, there was still the communal apartments, but in, in new blocks, it was, it, it was really based on the idea that they would have services. And uh, so the kitchen would be reduced to just a very small space for heating things up. And um, uh, they, although some of the more radical art architects like the idea that that should be a model for everybody, in practice it was more limited to being for people who were single, and uh, that they would. So it was kind of hostile, really. In in the end, um, they were referred to as hotel type um, housing. Um, as for assisted living, um, I think the very there was really very little in in that way in this in the 60s of actually building housing in ways that accommodated um, uh, uh, mobility problems for example right thank you um, uh, Susan I think uh, we have time left for one final question uh, uh, I'm sorry we can't uh, I'm very happy to see so many questions popping up and I'm sorry we can't uh, um, answer them all but I would like to end with Louis Siegelbaum who says hello Susan to what extent did the official Soviet discourse that distinguished between personal lichni, and private just prop, uh, uh, property uh, sorry between personal and private property apply in pe people's daily lives hello Louis uh, so that's a, a, a difficult one um the the distinction between the personal and the um the private the the in terms of property uh, is often merged in in people's everyday lives so a lot of the personal um it, the personal items um are are also particular um they're not they're not uh, uh, sorry, we, we, <laughs> I, I need to step back for a moment. So the the uh, um, items in people's um, daily lives and the housing itself uh, that is not private property, but they can make it very very personal through the um, the way that they change it, the way they carry out DIY on it, the way they they decorate it. I'm not sure if I've really answered your question, Lewis. I'm aware of lack of time. No, that, 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 that's perfectly fine. Susan, I want to thank you very, very much for this fascinating insight into um, your deep knowledge of uh, Soviet private space. I know it's only one of your many uh, specializations. We really appreciate it. And um, I would like to mention that next week uh, on May 6th, my next guest will be architectural historian Vladimir Kulic. Um, one of the co-curators of uh, the MoMA exhibition um, uh, about uh, Yugoslav um, uh, monumental architecture. Uh, 
and uh, I will speak with him about public space under socialism. And then week, one week later, on the 13th, my guest is Dagmar Hofustedt, spokesperson for the Federal Commissioner for the Stasi Archives, with whom I will discuss a secret space in the operations of the Stasi. So uh, before you all leave, uh, we have a little poll. Uh, we would love uh, for you to uh, answer if you have the chance. And um, then I would say um, goodbye, have a good week, and hope to see you next week. Thank you so much. And again, thank you very much, Susan Reed. <laughs>